Okay, uh, I want to give you some motivation for the Laplace differential equation. Uh, and uh, it will be given in two different ways. And although the second one is much more complicated, it's really important that you understand everything I say about the physical intuition behind them because they just pop up everywhere. Like, uh, if you're, whether you're doing a math major or a physics major, even engineering, uh, the concept of uh, something I'm going to explain, which is like the flux and the divergence and all this, uh, they, they are really important. Okay. All right, so let's start with some simple explanation of what Laplace equation is. But let me first write down the Laplace equation. Uh, it's a function of two variables where second derivative with respect to x plus second derivative with respect to y is equal to zero. That's called the Laplace differential equation. When do you get to, to get such a thing? Well, uh, you start with a 2D P equation. So uh, think about the case where instead of a iron bar that we were talking about in one dimensional heat equation, think about a metal plate where again this vertical direction is insulated so there's no heat loss and only the exposed part will be these boundaries, okay? Then uh, you have to think about the concavity of the temperature distribution here, right? So how do you talk about concavity of the temperature distribution? Well, uh, first of all, I have to say that we're going to know u, x, y, t for the temperature of a location x comma y at time t. Okay? So if you fix time, u would be a function of x and y, okay? And then uh, if you have a heat distribution that's like this, like that, like that, okay? That would be like concave down, right? And then you could also have a heat distribution that's like this, that's concave up. But in dimension two, I mean, for a two variable function, uh, you have another case, right? What's that called? There's some weird concavity going that can happen. You learned this in vector calculus. Nobody remembers. So it could be concave up on one direction, but concave down on the other direction. It's like, be like this, like. Uh, you know the Pringles chip, right? If you open it, uh, they, they look something like this, right? Okay. It's, it's round, but it's, it's like that, right? Do you know what this is called? Saddle, right. So this point right here is called the saddle point. That's right. Okay. okay. So uh, uh, when, when, you, when we talk about two variable functions, uh, critical points. At critical points you might have a relative maximum, relative minimum, or saddle point. Now what determines that? Do you, do you remember how to use the second derivative test on multivariable? Anyone? It's called the Hessian. Hessian of a function, two variable function, is defined as what? F double derivative with respect to x, F double derivative with respect to y, F x and then y, F y and then x. Right? That's called the Hessian. And uh, if 
the determinant of this is positive, then you know that the two eigenvalues of this, oh, by the way, before I say that, uh, because the second partial commute, fyx is same as fxy, so this is a symmetric matrix. And what you learn in linear algebra is that if you have a symmetric matrix, then it's diagonalizable. It will always have uh, eigenvectors with positive eigen, uh, well, not always, but uh, it will have two, two real eigenvalues. Uh, and although they could be equal, you have two distinct eigenvectors so that you can diagonalize this. Okay? So that's an important thing that you know about this symmetric matrix. So uh, you can talk about the two real eigenvalues of this matrix, and, and those will give you the uh, convexity in two different directions. Okay? And uh, if the determinant of this is positive, then you know that the, the signs of the two eigenvalues are equal. If the determinant of this matrix is negative, then it means that one eigenvalue is positive and the other is negative. Now, uh, the problem is, I don't think many of you have seen the Hessian. Rather, you're given this formula that you can get from the Hessian, which is the determinant of this matrix. So, if you take the determinant of this matrix, so if you take the determinant of the Hessian, uh, then you get uh, AD minus BC, right? which is FXX FYY minus FXY squared. Have you seen this one? Okay. Yeah, right? So uh, you were taught in multivariable calculus that if this value is negative, then you have a saddle. Okay? If this is positive, then you would either have relative minimum or relative maximum, depending on the sign of FXX. And if sometimes it's hard to figure out what FXX would be, then you can just go for FYY. So uh, that's how you figure out the convexity. Uh, now, what does this have to do? What does this have anything to do with the heat equation? Well, we know that if it's convex like this, what's going to happen to the heat? Would the temperature go up? So think about this point. Would the temperature here go up or down? Down. It'll go down because it's concave down, right? Yeah. Here it's going to go up, right? How about here? Sorry. At the saddle point, well, it depends on which one's more concave, right? So if it's more concave up than down, if it's like kind of uh, like, uh, not so harsh slope here, but then very steep slope over here with the concavity, then it'll be going up, right? But if they balance out, then it's going to be it depends zero. On the yeah, so if they balance, if the two concavity balances out, then the, the temperature will, here will just stay put. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's not going to change. Do you, do you agree? It okay. depends on the direction, right? Uh, no. It, no, I'm just, oh, so, so there, there are like two principal directions, which are the eigenvectors of this matrix. Yeah. Uh, so you get the, the direction where it's the most concave up and the direction which is most concave down. And it's something that you can yeah. get out of this matrix. Okay. All right. Uh, so you kind of see there's something happening here. And, and then uh, you can eventually say that what's important is really the trace of this matrix. The trace of a matrix is the sum of the diagonals. So if you take the trace of the Hessian of f, that's going to be f differentiated twice plus f differentiated twice. f differentiated twice in x and f differentiated twice in y. And that value is going to determine which one is bigger. Okay, if this is positive, then it's, it's more concave up than down. If this is negative, then it's more concave down than up. Okay. So this, this value is going to determine the rate of change of the heat. So the two-dimensional heat equation goes like this. The rate of change of the heat with respect to time would be proportional 
to this concavity, so uh, uxx plus uyy, so that if you turn that proportionality into an equation by using proportionally constant k, it'll be uh, u differentiated by t. Rate of change of the temperature would be some constant times uxx plus uyy. And that's the heat, two-dimensional heat equation. And it kind of makes sense because one dimensional will be just this one, right? That's one dimensional heat equation. The two dimensional will be like that. And you can even guess what three dimensional heat equation would be. What would that be? Z. UZZ would be added here, right? So that would be a three dimensional heat equation. So if you want to solve the, the three dimensional heat equation in full generality, then what you would do, do would be exactly that. And, and by the way, uh, you, you, you can solve this heat equation 3D on a box with some constant values at the endpoints, uh, at the boundaries. And the solution is exactly the uh, separation of variables. It's just it's like three times longer because you have x and y and z. Yeah. Uh, but there's n nothing novel about what you do over there. So it's exactly the same separation of variables. Okay. So that's the two-dimensional heat equation. Oh, one more thing that I want to say over here is it's a, it's a bit tough for me to explain because we, I mean, you guys, most of you took linear algebra, right? But uh, you really didn't do uh, transformation of bases. Did you do that? Transforming one base to the other? Well, it, uh, it turns out that, huh? DPD or right that, right? Is it? I don't know. Uh, I'm not so sure if, if you learned that there. But it turns out that uh, uh, if you take a, take a function and you take a, at a point, if you rotate this so that the, the x and y are now rotated in, in a, another basis, or ortho, another orthogonal basis, if you rotate it, this value stays the same. The, the sum stays the same, which is very important because it basically says that this value really is about the shape, not the coordinate system. Okay? Uh, and that's a, 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 a consideration that physicists and also mathematicians, they, they think a lot. They, they want their formulas to be independent of the coordinate system. So uh, whether you take the XYZ coordinate system or, or just the XY coordinate system, and, and if you rotate this slightly and do an, another coordinate system to express the same geometry in a slightly different variable, you get the same value. And that's another important property about this one. Okay? Uh, it, it, in fact, if you take any formula that's made of second derivative so that it talks about concavity, and you impose the condition that it has to be independent of the coordinate change, then the only kind of formula you can write would be this one with some constant multiple. That's what you get. And that's, that's a bit harder to prove, but uh, uh, that, that's in fact true. So, Could you explain uh, what is fx plus xyy in geometry? Uh, Russia? It, it's like this, this quantity where uh, you take the principal, two principal di direction where it's the most concave down and most concave up. Yeah. And if you add them together, that value is this one. Now, you, you might think, well, how do you know that those are x and y? No, you, you don't care. It, even if the, so the, first of all, we know that the two uh, vectors will be orthogonal. Yeah. And there will be a, a coordinate change so that x and y are that direction. But then uh, that value is going to stay constant even if you take two other directions. Okay. So that, that's... Uh, that's what you get. All right. So I'm not asking you to understand everything I said, uh, but hopefully this kind of makes sense. This is a two-dimensional heat equation, right? OK, now uh, what we want to do is you take t to infinity. And there are several cases. So for example, let's say you have this plate where 
the three sides are touching ice, but then this other side is kept at 10 degrees Celsius. Right? OK? Yeah. And then you, that time goes to infinity. Can you picture the shape of the heat distribution? So it's like if you if you draw the 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 uh, what's, what's, what is it called? Uh, okay, if you do terrain maps, uh, yeah. If you do level curves, you learn level curves, right? Yeah. So the level curves will be something like uh, it's, it's ten here, so it'll be something like this, right? Yeah. The level curves will be like that. Do you agree? Okay. I mean, 10 here will be 0, 0, 0 here. So uh, as you go close to this side, it will be a constant. But then uh, here it will be 9, and then it will be 8, and then 7. Mm -hmm. And then eventually it goes down to 0. So that will be the level curves, right? Yeah. And uh, you should also agree that if you send time to infinity, this will be in a stable configuration, right? Yeah. It's not going to change much. Okay? So uh, at that time, if you, at, at time very close to infinity, what will be the value of ut? Once the, Zero. yeah, it'll be, it, it's stabilized. What does stabilized mean? It doesn't change much, right? It does, the, the value of the temperature doesn't change much with respect to time. So this side will be equal to zero. Okay? And then you can divide by k, and what do you get that the resulting thing is the Laplace differential equation, right? So the Laplace differential equation is uh, what happens at time t infinity if you're fixing some boundary conditions. And if you have that insight, then even without solving the differential equation, you can, you can think of the solutions like that. Okay. Being able to come up with some picture is really helpful. So uh, let, let's think about another case. If you had, say, 10 and 10 here, and 0 and 0 here, what do you think the temperature distribution would be like in terms of level curves? Mm -hmm. like, this, right? And here it will be exactly like that. There will be some symmetry, right? So it will be 10 over here and then 9, 8, and then actually this will be 5 because it's right at the middle, right? Yeah. Okay. Can you picture this in 3D? Yeah. You know how to read maps, right? If you're given terrain maps, you can, you can think about which one's the mountain, which one's the valley, and all that, yeah. So if you if you can read maps, you should be able to read this level curve. Okay. So if you picture it, then you can gain some insights. Okay. Now, another thing that you immediately understand is because you have two concavity adding up to zero. If one's positive, the other is negative, right? Which means that at every point of the solution, the point is a saddle. We don't call it a saddle point because uh, saddle points are where the uh, derivative also is equal to zero. So it's like, it, and it's flat, flat tangent line. Right? But uh, it, the, the local geometry will look like a saddle. Okay? It will be like a Pringles chip, but not like that. It will be somewhat tilted. Okay? So uh, that, that's really helpful in picturing such functions. Okay? Now, uh, because such functions are so much important in complex analysis. There's a name for such a function. So the, these functions are called so such functions uh, are called harmonic. I should have looked up Wikipedia or something to figure out where this word comes from, but it's called harmonic. I don't exactly know where it comes from. Okay. 